गुड मॉर्निंग मैम गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग सो जस्ट थ्री ऑफ यू राइट नाउ यस मैम सो अदर्स आर ज्वाइनिंग यू आर ए क्लास Uh, I'll just send a reminder again in the morning. Okay. So uh, students are joining, right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, certainly. Okay. Okay. Because there, right now, there are just three of you. Okay. So should we start? or should we wait for one or two minutes ma'am we should wait for another two or three minutes all right okay no problem we'll continue with gi law only today yes ma'am Ma'am, how GI is different from the trademark? You tell me. How do you think it is different? See, the main primary difference between the two is uh, on principles. Okay, so on principles, uh, uh, trademark law is supposed to be an individual right, but uh, the law of GI is never supposed to be a individual right. Because GI law is GI law talks about uh, GI law is about uh, community rights. That's one of the basic differences. And then when you will read the provisions, you you definitely come to know that there's a lot of difference between trademarks and GIs. For example, in case of trademark, usually an enterprise or a company would apply for a trademark. but in case of a gi it is open to everybody who is from a particular geographical territory who is manufacturing the same kind of product they can all uh, they can all be users of that particular geographical indication would you do you get it what i'm saying yes yes got it got it ma'am yeah, so Very one much. is community right The other right, one is right. individual rights, and see, uh, GI is a very unique uh, intellectual property rights because most IPR are supposed to be individual rights. You look at patent; patent is supposed to be an individual right. You talk about copyright; it is supposed to be an individual right. But when you look at GI, GI is not at all an individual mm -hmm. right. It is always a community right, and uh, anyone from a particular ter particular territory who produces a GI product. is a, a, when he applies for becoming an authorized user and he can be given the right to use the gi while selling his products so that's the basic difference yes, between the two all right so uh, there are five of you i'll start the class because there's no point waiting right it's right ma'am 10 10 10 minutes okay so i will be starting with the uh, ppt number 3 which i have sent you you have you have been receiving my ppts right yes ma'am yeah so we'll start with uh, ppt number 3 that is about uh, international uh, convention and treaties relating to uh, geographical indications uh, can you see the screen can you see the ppt yes ma'am okay yes ma'am yeah so say uh, the international treaties on geographical indications are regulated by two bodies one body is the wipo that is world intellectual property organization and another treaty is regulated by wto world trade organization now if you remember my class lectures i have told you that it is actually wipo which regulates different international treaties on intellectual property rights when it comes to wto world trade organization they just have one uh, international uh, treaty which they regulate that is trips agreement and you know the history behind trips agreement because it is the developed countries who were not very happy because 
because the other countries in the world were not providing IPR protection or even if they were pro providing IPR protection, they felt that the IPR protection was very less. So when negotiations for the establishment of World Trade Organization was discussed at an international forum and every country obviously for easing their trade. See, no country in the world is self-sufficient. Everybody needs to have uh, export-import relationship with a foreign country to survive. Now, hence everybody wanted to become a member of WTO because WTO eased out the process of international uh, international trade by uh, bringing in dispute settlement uh, mechanism by making dispute settlement very easy by various other means they they made the international trade very easy and every country wanted to become the member of WTO now they said that you cannot become a member of the WTO and this was actually the politics of the developed countries. They said you cannot become members of the WTO until and unless you sign certain international agreements. And one of the agreements which were made compulsory to become members of WTO is TRIPS, Agreement on Trade Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights, which standardized and said that this is the bare minimum IPR protection that you have to grant. And only if you grant this IPR protection will you be able to become a member of the WTO. So countries like India, China, Brazil were not at all happy with the TRIPS agreement. They did not want this kind of a strict adherence to IPR laws, but they definitely wanted to become a member of the WTO. Hence, they were, f they were actually bound to sign the TRIPS agreement as it is. So when it comes to uh, GI Treaty and conventions under WTO, there is just one, it is TRIPS agreement. But WIPO is actually the agency that you see that regulates different kind of intellectual property rights, not just pertaining to GIs, pertaining to patent, copyright, trademark, etc. So the main body which looks into the IPR worldwide is WIPO, not WTO. WTO just has one uh, international agreement which they brought in to bring in uniformity of IPR, that is TRIPS agreement. Now, when you look into WIPO's treaties and conventions, WIPO's treaties and conventions can be classified into two categories. The first category is treaties regarding general standards of protection, where just a general standard of what kind of protection relating to GIs can be accorded is mentioned. And secondly is treaties regarding international registration of GI. Now, what is international registration of GI? See, the purpose of the GI law will not be served just because the GI registry in India has registered a product as a geographical indication. So, for example, uh, Banarasi Sari is, is a registered GI, but it is a registered GI in India. Now, the question is, or let me take a better example. Let me take the example of maybe Alfonso mangoes. Now, Alfonso mangoes is something uh, which is seeped, uh, which is sought after, a uh, sought after product everywhere in the world. Now, Alfonso mangoes may be a registered GI in India, but that's not sufficient because Alfonso mangoes are exported to many countries, including a lot of European countries. Now, if uh, in those European countries there is import of mangoes from other countries and those mangoes are also sold under the banner of Alfonso mangoes, definitely it goes to the detriment of the interest of the genuine Alfonso mango growers in India. So just because there is a registration of GI with regard to Alfonso mangoes in India is not going to give the protection in the European countries. So in Europe also, it needs to be recognized and protected as a geographical indication. So the point is you have to then go to the individual European countries and file for GI registration, which is, which is, very, which is not feasible because it involves a lot of money, it involves a lot of time, etc. So uh, there are certain international treaties which helps you with regard to international registration of GI, which means that you give one application and WIPO will help you in getting registration in, a multi in multiple countries. So there are certain treaties regarding general standards of protection, but, and there are certain treaties regarding international registration of GI. So uh, ma'am? Yeah, just one second. So under WIPO, okay. both these kind of treaties are existing. Yes, tell me. Uh, Ma'am, uh, GI is uh, origin uh, related, right? Mm -hmm. So how uh, uh, GI for a same product can be just given to the multiple countries? 
if its main characters is just because uh, it has been originated at a particular place the characteristics or the reputation has been acquired just because of that place only mm-hmm. so as you cited the example of alfonso mango mm-hmm. suppose it is being registered in india mm-hmm. so how uh, i mean the same can be registered in the european countries as well uh well i'm not saying that they are registered as a gi in the european countries but the thing is that only when you are registered as a gi you get the infringement rights rights are conferred yeah. to you and you will be able to bring in infringement suits now the thing is yeah. that in europe suppose alfonso mangoes are not registered as a gi now for example there are mangoes which are imported for some from some uh, you know south asian countries for example from malaysia to europe right now now the yeah. sellers are very deceptively selling those malaysian mangoes as also alfonso mangoes now the indian right. gi uh, the proprietors of alfonso mangoes want to file a infringement case against them in the european countries because that's where the cause of action has happened right so fine. but the point is that how will they file the infringement case because they are not a registered gi in that european country okay 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 so do you understand i am not saying that the yes. malaysian mango will yes, be yes. given gi registration there but for the indian proprietors to also file an infringement case there it needs to be registered as a gi in those european countries right fine 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 okay right, move on Now coming to the WIPO treaties regarding general standards of protection the first one is the Paris convention and the Paris convention of 1883 is not just an international convention pertaining to GI specific it is the uh, international convention pertaining to all kind of industrial property i have already told you in the class earlier that uh, before the trips agreement ipr was classified into two categories one is industrial property and the second one was copyright and related rights so iprs which were not part of copyright and related rights came under the concept of industrial property and the paris convention of 1883 deals with all kind of industrial property including patent trademark gis etc now if you look into the specific provisions of the paris convention you will see that they never uh use the word geographical indications gi because gi was the term which was first ever coined in the trips agreement this is a this is a convention of 1883 trips is the convention of 1994 more than 100 years the term geographical indications that we use now was only coined for the first time in the trips agreement in 1994 so till 1883 there was no concept of uh there was no concept of uh the geographical indications so when you read the provisions of the paris convention you see that indication of source and appellation of origin is what is protected under the paris convention although the paris convention does not define what is an indication of source or what is an appellation of origin and uh, those of you who have attended my lecture the last time you know what is an indication of source and appellation of origin right yes Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now what does the Paris Convention say? The Paris Convention says that goods which bear illegal trademark or trade name will be seized when imported to member countries of the convention, which means that how can you relate it to GI? suppose somebody is using an illegal indication of source saying that it is made in india but not actually made in india so the mark which is used is illegal and hence these marks uh, will be considered to be illegal marks under the paris convention and the paris convention says that the products will be seized where unlawfully the trade name or the mark is affixed and a country should not uh, should actually put a ban on the importation of such products where illegal trade name has been used however there might be certain countries which might not impose ban on importation but once it is imported there should be internal mechanisms that by internal seizure or by prohibiting pro- uh, placing prohibition of import itself it should be seen that the products with illegal trade name should not be registered or should not be uh, allowed to come and be a part of the trade system in that particular country 
Now coming to the second WIPO treaty regarding general standards of protection, it is agreement for the repression of false or deceptive indication of source on goods, 1891. Now, uh, as I told you, under the Paris Convention, only the term indication of source is, uh, uses the term indication of source. However, there are a lot of disadvantages of the Paris Convention because the Paris Convention only talks about something which is, uh, uh, which is false, false uh, indication of source, but it does not talk about deceptive indication of source. Uh, do you have an idea what is what is a false indication of source and what is a deceptive indication of source? Anyone? Can anyone tell me what's the difference between a false indication of source and a deceptive indication of source? Yes. Uh... Uh, Ma'am, uh, deceptive indication could be, <coughs> suppose, Alfonso mangoes, um, um, uh, you know, being produced only in India. And I just sold those mangoes by saying that Alfonso mangoes uh, made from uh, Malaysia. So uh, this is a sort of uh, deceptive one. And uh, if... Uh, uh, Hello? Yeah, 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 yeah. See, uh, if, if you take the example of Alfonso Mango, so Alfonso Mango, suppose it is, uh, it is from India. So that is the current geographical indications. So Alfonso Mangoes from Malaysia is not a deceptive uh, is not a deceptive indication of source it is actually a it is actually a false indication of source because alfonso mangoes cannot be from malaysia and alfonso mangoes has to be from india right now if there is somebody who uses not alfonso mangoes but alfonso mangoes alfonso alfonso spelling is a l p h o n s o right now they don't use the word alfonso as such they say alfonso a l f e n s o alfonso but when people speak or say or pronounce the word it seems like it would seem still like a alfonso mango so although it is uh, so this is this is deception why do you have a word like alfonso mango because you want to deceive the consumers right so that's a deceptively similar mark now i have given an example if you see in the last point now cogne is a particular brandy that is produced in france so you keep on hearing a lot of examples of wines and spirits and geographical indications. Now, Cogni is a particular brandy that is produced in France. Now, uh, the example of Cogni made in California will be actionable under the Paris Convention. Why? Because Paris Convention uh, gives protection against false indication of marks. So Cogni is produced in France. Cogni cannot be produced anywhere else in the world. So Cogni made in California will definitely be actionable under the Paris Convention because it is a false mark. However, Calognac, now it's not Cogni. In the first example, it's Cogni, Cogni, Cogni. In France, Cogni made in California. In the second example, it is not Cogni, but it is Calogne, which is made in California. Now, Calogne made in California will not get protection under the Paris Convention because the Paris Convention says that only if it is false, if it is wrong, Cogne cannot be from California, Cogne has to be from France. But when it, a case comes of Calogne made in California, Paris Convention says that we will not be able to accord protection because we just confine ourselves to false indications. But this may be misleading but it will not come under our scope because it is misleading. It's not Cogni. Had it been Cogni made in California, definitely it, it comes as a violation to the Paris Convention. But here, because the sellers are not at all using the word Cogni, but they're definitely using the word Cologne, which is nothing to do with Cogni, we will not offer you protection. So do you understand? So Cogni made in France is the, is the GI. Cogni made in California will be the false indication but calogne made in california may be a misleading indication but it is not a false indication do you understand the difference everyone yes ma'am yes, right ma what about the other and mislead okay yes what ma'am is deceptive i can't hear you properly misleading both 
Hello. Yes, please tell me. Ma'am, uh, the example you cited here, deceptive and misleading, both are the same one. This, yeah, deceptive and misleading are same. Yes. All right. Okay, so, so we deceptive move. things are not protected as far as the uh, as far as the Paris Convention is concerned. But it will it the misleading the misleading uh, marks will be considered to be illegal under this second international convention, which is agreement for the false represent of false or deceptive indication of source of goods. See, Paris Convention only this part false. But the second agreement which we are talking about right now, 1891, Paris Convention 1883, 1891, this not only deals with false indications but also deceptive indications. So both will be considered to be illegal under this particular international convention. Now coming to this, the, the next one, the next category, the next category is about WIPO treaties regarding international registration of GI. So there is just one international uh, uh, instrument so far which uh, provides a mechanism by which, uh, uh, by which uh, with the help of one single application, multiple registrations can be done in different, in different countries. Now this is the only international convention is the Lisbon Agreement for the Protection of Appellation of Origin and their international registration. Now, this international agreement, Lisbon Agreement, is not on indication of goods, as you can see from the title in itself. But this indication is only an indication. This, this is an international instrument only for appellation of origin. Right? So first, this is the demerit. It is not about all kind of GIs. It is only pertaining to appellation of origin and their international registration. Now, what is the procedure which is given under this Lisbon Agreement? The procedure for international registration which is given under this particular instrument is that, first, uh, the GI will be registered in the home country. For example, it's an Indian GI. The first registration will be done by the GI registry in India. Then, an application has to be forwarded. Suppose I have got we I have got a GI registered with the GI registry in India. Then I for I give an application to GI registry and I, and I request them please forward this application to WIPO's International Bureau because I want multiple registration of my GI in different countries. So from GI registry in India, the application will be forwarded to WIPO's International Bureau. Now the next procedure, once WIPO's International Bureau gets the application, it will notify to those countries where protection is sought. For example, I want my GI to be protected in America. I want it to be protected in Canada. I want it to be protected in Germany, France, four countries. Now the moment my application reached WIPO, WIPO will notify to the offices concerned, like there is a GI registry in India, there will be GI offices in the other four countries. So in those other four countries, uh, the WIPO, WIPO's International Bureau will notify them. And it will also be published in the official bulletin of the Lisbon system. And within a year, the country has to, the, the country where I have asked for registration either has to say yes to me or no to me. And in case the member nation does not register my GI, it has to notify within one year. And he, it has also to mention the reasons why my GI is not registered in those particular, why they have denied registration to my GI in their country. Now, once it is registered, the appellation of origin shall be protected against any kind of imitation. So against false, against false appellation of origin, misleading appellation of origin, all kind of protection will be offered under the Lisbon system. However, India is yet not a member of the Lisbon system. That is one of the biggest demerits. So although right now we have more than tr around 363 geographical indications, but if a GI proprietor in India wants international registration of the GI, the proprietor has no other mechanism but to go to the country individually <coughs> and file for GI registration uh, because we are not part of the Lisbon Agreement and the WIPO's International Bureau will not come to our help, right? However, Budir, I can't hear you properly. Ma'am, is there any... Uh, is there any reason why India didn't sign the... 
I can't hear you. Um, is any reason behind for India not to sign this Lisbon agreement? There are two reasons you can say. Number one is um, GI law itself is very controversial, right? And this agreement, as I told you, has a disadvantage. This agreement just pertains to appellation of origin. It does not include all kinds of geographical indications. If you look into our legislation, our legislation is not pertaining just to appellation of origin, right? Our GI Act is pertaining to geographical indications, which may include both geographical indications and indication of source. And I explained you the difference between the three terms in the last online lecture that we have had. So all, because of all these factors, India never seriously took up the Lisbon Agreement, right? And of course, many other countries also who joined it could not use the Lisbon system a lot, mainly because of the reason that Lisbon Agreement was only pertaining to appellation of origin. And if you remember the last lecture online uh, the appellation of origins criteria is very very strict you can become a geographical indication to, but to be an appellation of origin you have to fulfill a lot of criteria so for this particular reason also the lisbon agreement was not that successful and because of which just look into the next slide because of which there's a recent development that has taken place with regard to the Lisbon Agreement. There's a recent development which has taken place. What is the recent development which has taken place? A Geneva Act of the Lisbon Agreement has been enacted in 2015, but it has come to force only uh, uh, one and a half months back on February 26, 2020. Now the thing is that this Geneva Act of the Lisbon Agreement, how is it different from the initial initial Lisbon agreement. Now, as I told you, the Lisbon agreement has a demerit because the Lisbon agreement only talks about appellation of origin. However, this Geneva Act of the Lisbon agreement now extends the protection to all geographical indications, uh, which was previously only restricted to appellation of origin. So Lisbon agreement initially only appellation of origin, Geneva Act 2015, which came into force in 2020, took note of it, now extended uh, the Lisbon Agreement, the uh, Lisbon Agreement not only to appellation of origin, but also to all geographical indications. So, so the first disadvantage of the Lisbon Agreement has been covered up by the Geneva Act. Now, what are the other essential features of Geneva Act? It's very interesting. So through a single application, an applicant can obtain registration in all the member countries of the Geneva Act without the need to designate such member countries. So earlier, suppose India wanted to uh, international registration in four countries. So they have to specify these four countries. So now that's not the system. Once, through one single application, suppose Geneva Act has 30 members. So the moment you get given application to the, under the Geneva Act, you will get protection or registration in all the 30 countries. So with one single application, an applicant can obtain registration in all the member countries of the Geneva Act without the need to designate such member countries. Earlier, you had to designate the member countries. Now you don't have to designate the member countries. So that's first advantage of the Geneva Act. The second one, uh, within one year of registration by WIPO, the member countries of Geneva Act can refuse the registration so granted and notify WIPO of the same. Now there are 30 members of the Geneva Act, but two countries might not be happy with, uh, with the GI registration. So within one year, they have to say that in our country, we cannot afford the GI uh, registration. And this is the reason why we cannot give protection to the GI registration. Now, the third point is very, very interesting and it pertains to one of the most controversial uh, geographical indications, uh, which has a link to India also, Basmati rice. Now, you have to understand at the international forum, there has been a lot of debate of this Basmati rice because not only India, but Pakistan also keeps claiming that uh, we grow Basmati rice. And that has been one of the bone of contention. And the question is that, can India and Pakistan together file for Basmati rice GI registration? Earlier, there was no mechanism by which two countries can actually file for a GI together. But the Geneva Act actually took note of this kind of matters and said that if a member wishes to file an application to register a GI jointly established with a neighboring country, it is possible to do so. So inter internationally, internationally uh, you can see that 
Now, for Basmati rice, both India and Pakistan can file the GI registration together. Now, the other thing, the registration will be given for uh, indefinite time. There are no renewal fees is required, as is the case of the other GI mechanisms. And every country is free to choose its type of legislation to protect the GI or an appellation of origin. Now, as I told you, under the TRIPS agreement also, there was no obligation that to protect GI, you need to bring a sui generis legislation. You could even offer protection to GI under your trademark mechanism. So the Geneva Act retains it because they know that there will be huge opposition from America, Australia, and such many other countries if they make sui generis legislation compulsory for GI law so they leave it free to the countries to decide whether they want a sui generis legislation or trademark law now uh, as i told you most of the disadvantages of the uh, of the lisbon agreement <coughs> has been take, has been taken care of by the uh, by the geneva act and it is now uh, it is now discussed by many scholars of Geographical Indication Act that India should not delay and India should actually uh, file for registration, uh, international registration under the Geneva Act. Because you have to understand that there are certain Indian products which have a huge demand in the foreign market. For example, Indian handicrafts. If you talk about just one example, Indian carpets. Indian carpets has a huge demand in the world market. Now, in other countries, if the GI is not registered as i told you earlier also you cannot file infringement case because you are not a registered gi in that foreign country the geneva act provides you a mechanism of registering your gi in the foreign country and many scholars are saying that india should definitely now consider being a member of the geneva act although india did not decide to become a member of the initial lisbon agreement Okay, now coming to the second part, as I told you in the beginning of this uh, session, that uh, G in the GI treaties and conventions, some are regulated under WIPO. There are three uh, international conventions that I have discussed under WIPO. The first one is the Paris Convention, and then the second one is Agreement for the False Repression of False yes. or Deceptive Indication of Source. Then with regard to treaties regarding international registration of GI, I just talked about the Lisbon Agreement. So now we move to the GI convention under WTO, that is the TRIPS Agreement. Now see, uh, the uniqueness of the TRIPS Agreement so far as geographical indication is concerned is that it for the first time coined the word geographical indication. Before the TRIPS Agreement of 1994, there was no term as geographical indication. So the, the term, the definition of geographical indication that we know today comes from the TRIPS Agreement. Now, uh, the TRIPS Agreement, what is the main purpose of the TRIPS Agreement? It provides a minimum standard of protection for all intellectual property rights, including GI. So it says that this much of protection has to be given to these IPRs, including geographical indication. If you are a member country of TRIPS Agreement, you have no other mechanism but to follow it if you want to continue being a member of the World Trade Organization. Now, it provides for certain additional or special privileges in GIs relating to wines and spirits. I will come to it. What does it mean? Now, uh, the provisions relating to GI is included from Article 22 to 24 of the TRIPS Agreement. Okay, so uh, I have to discuss this with you. Just give me a second. Okay, uh, uh, can you uh, see this? Uh, 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 one second. Share screen. Okay, so can you see this? The new, the new, uh, the new, the new document in front of you? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. This is the TRIPS agreement relating to geographical indications. So, so it starts basically from Article 22. So TRIPS Agreement, Article 22, Protection of Geographical Indications. So 22.1, Article 22.1 defines what is a geographical indication. So this is a definition indications, which identify a good as originating in the territory of a member 
or a region or locality where a given quality, reputation, or other characteristic of the good is essentially attributable to its geographical origin. The definition of GI that we uh, discussed in the last online lecture, so that definition comes from Article 22, 1 of the TRIPS agreement. Now, what I want you to understand right now is this particular controversial article of the TRIPS agreement. Article 23, which provides only for additional protection for GIs for wines and spirits. Now see, uh, there's a way, and this is what, why I'm saying this is one of the most controversial uh, provision of TRIPS agreement pertaining to GIs, because you can see that this provision is being biased to two, to biased to two products, that is wines and spirits, and this was entirely to pacify the European countries. Now the European countries had a lot of problem, a lot of problem in the sense that, you know, uh, as I told you, if you remember last, last, the last discussion about America and why America is not happy with the geographical indication law, because uh, a lot of the American population are immigrants from Europe. And when these Europeans traveled to, uh, traveled and settled in America, they also took along with their tradition, their tradition and their culture and their customs. And one of the tradition has been uh, wine making. Now, suppose somebody from France, France moved to uh, moved to America and settled there. Somebody from Scotland moved to America and settled there. They took their culture, they took their tradition also, which included the wine and spirit making uh, tradition. Now, uh, so basically, what started happening? was in California, a lot of winemaking started and they started selling uh, uh, products like champagne made in California, right? So uh, 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 scotch, scotch like, like whiskey made in California and all the European countries, uh, the European countries were not at all happy by it because, you know, uh, the export of these kind of wines and spirits brought in a lot of, um, uh, brought, brought in a lot of money to these European countries and, we, and they were not at all happy with this practice which was going on in America. So they said that, uh, so when there was the discussion on geographical indications at an international platform of um, WTO, they said we need additional protection for geographical indications. Now you have to understand how is this provision so biased. For example, uh, Darjeeling tea is not a wine and spirit. So Darjeeling tea will get just the ordinary protection under the TRIPS agreement, but Champagne, because it's a, it comes under the category of wines and spirits, will be given extra protection under the TRIPS agreement. For example, in Japan, in Japan, uh, there is a shop where tea is sold. Now, in that, uh, somebody is selling a tea, and in that packaging, they are writing Darjeeling like tea. The tea is like that of Darjeeling, or the tea is as aromatic as Darjeeling. Now, the Tea Board of India, who is the proprietor of Darjeeling Tea, the GI Darjeeling Tea, will find it very difficult to get an order in their favor, even if they approach the Japanese courts. Why? Because it does not come under the additional protection category. And the party who is selling the tea, saying that it is Darjeeling like tea or Darjeeling aromatic tea, which easily get away by bringing in the argument and saying that, see, we are not claiming that this is a tea from Darjeeling. Because in our packaging itself, we have written that this is Darjeeling like tea. We are not saying it is Darjeeling tea, but we are saying it is Darjeeling like tea. Or we are not saying that it is Darjeeling tea, but we are just saying that the aroma of this tea is like Darjeeling tea. So they can easily get away. But if you look at 23.1, the provision, which gives additional protection to geographical indications for wines and spirits, it says that even if in a particular product it is written that it is kind, it is a kind of champagne, it is a type of champagne, or it is like champagne, it is like champagne, this will not be given protection because wines and spirits are given additional protection. So even if you are saying it is like and it is not champagne, but still you will not, you, it will be considered to be an infringement. So do you understand the difference? Now, I am, for example, trying to sell a wine and writing that it is champagne-like wine. I will be violating 23.1. 
because 23 one says that you have to give extra protection to wines and spirits so even if you are writing that it is just an